And then today we finished that, the issue on renormalization and we transition into some of the predictions. The, where we are are the following. We, we looked at the diagram that looks like that. That's the self-energy, sigma p. And we talked about it enough to show that you can pick out the wave function renormalization constant, which is z2. That's the wave function renormalization for a fermion. So you've changed the propagator for the fermion, and you get that. The other thing we did was the vacuum polarization, which pictured like this. This is I pi of pi mu nu of q squared, which is I q, q squared g mu nu minus q mu q nu times some scalar function of q squared. And we showed that this sums, if you sum all these types of diagrams, the propagator turns into minus i g mu nu over q squared minus, uh, sorry, 1 minus pi Q squared. And we I then identified the wave function renormalization constant C3 is 1 over 1 minus pi of Q, pi of 0. Okay, so right near the pole, you identify that. Just because we're going to use it today, I want to, we're going to use it two ways. I want to give you what pi is again. It actually so pi of q squared has some pi of 0, the, the piece that goes into the renormalization. Let me just call it pi hat of q squared, which is the difference. Pi of 0 starts off like, oh, what was it? What's the constant? e squared over 6 pi squared. It's 1 over epsilon. That's the difference between four dimensions plus log square root 4 pi, plus a bunch of stuff. That I, that's actually the boring stuff. Mm. Pi hat, though, is the interesting stuff of q squared, is this e squared over 6 pi squared times q squared over 10 m squared plus higher order terms, when q squared is much, much less than m squared. But so it starts off. Taylor expands it as analytically, and it goes like e squared over 6 pi squared um, minus a half log q squared over mu squared, m squared when q squared is bigger than m squared. Okay? So that's That's that piece, okay? So we have, you've seen Z2, we've seen Z3. You can guess that we have to do Z1, right? That's logical. Where does Z1 come in? Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to do charge renormalization. And to do charge renormalization, we're going to do scattering. So if you remember, uh, so recall the start of the renormalization section. When I started the renormalization section, I said that I was going to do scattering. And I did this, and I did this. And I said that d sigma d omega is, well, in the non-relativistic limit, log q squared is 4m squared over q squared, q to the fourth, sorry, q vector to the fourth, alpha 
1 minus alpha pi of q squared. That was my notation then. It's actually a little bit sloppy to do it that way, but that's what I did. And I said that this was really alpha zero, and then I defined alpha is alpha one minus alpha pi of zero by looking at, at this thing at this this being the renormalized one. Okay, now that turns out to be right. Uh, the, everything I said there is is right. Notation is a bit bit odd, but nevertheless, that's what I did. Um, but I didn't do it fully. So let's we have to think about how we do it fully. If you think about it, the I was really hiding a few things there, because really what you have to do is you have to do a bigger set of diagrams. There's this diagram plus a diagram that looks like this, where you have a photon going around that vertex there, plus a photon going around this vertex, plus then the vacuum polarization comes in, and then there's diagrams that look like this, plus diagrams that look like that. So if you were to write out all the diagrams, which you're now, you're now good at, there you'd, you'd write out all of them. Okay, these guys, those guys don't enter. So these guys we're not going to consider. Okay, they, they're there. They're finite. They, easy, they're not that easy to calculate. But the basic thing that will come out is they're not, not proportional to the basic vertex. So the, you know, basically what I'm going to end up doing is saying that there's something proportional to the, the basic vertex, this guy. I'm going to collect all the things that look like that and call that the renormalized charge. These are not proportional to gamma mu, gamma mu. Okay, in other words, there's no, not a, a single vertex at the top and one at the bottom where the other ones will be. Okay, so those are by tradition dropped. Okay, this guy we've done, but these guys are called the vertex correction. So we have to do this. We have to talk about those. And that's, of course, where Z1 comes in. Okay, so let's, let's, do the vertex correction, then we'll come back and do the whole renormalization. Okay. Well, vertex correction is the diagrams. That first, you start off with that vertex. That's the basic vertex. And then you add to it the one where the photon goes around like that. Okay. Okay. This would be minus I E gamma mu if I take off the external stuff. And this one will be defined to be minus I E gamma mu of P and P prime. Okay. Okay, so the overall vertex then is the sum of these. So if I take the sum of those guys, is defined to be minus I E lambda mu of P and P prime. And that's the overall vertex. Okay, so we can write out what that is. Let's just write it out just to do it. Minus I E gamma mu is the integral d4k over 2 pi to the fourth 
That's for k up there, so there's a minus i over k squared from the photon propagator. If I draw the arrow that looks like that, this would be p minus k, and that one would be p prime minus k. So the form of the, the vertex is then um, yeah. minus i e gamma, let's call it gamma lambda. There's an i over p slash minus k slash minus m. Let's remember, we we look at it going this way, but write it going that way. And these are matrices, so the order makes a difference. There's um, the next thing that happens is a minus i e gamma mu, because that's the coupling to the external photon. Then there's a i over p slash minus p prime slash minus k slash minus m and minus i e gamma lambda again, where that's a gamma lambda there, where the index on this index matters some because they care, they're the same photon. Okay? So this guy's a big matrix. Okay? Um, so in addition to doing all the Feynman algebra stuff, you have to figure out what that matrix is. However, if you if you look at the full vertex, so you take what we've done is we've taken let's take an electron p prime j mu electron of p. That's this u bar p prime minus i gamma mu, e, e gamma mu, minus i e, this, this other gamma mu, p prime. Okay. We, we know from what we did last time that there's a gauge invariance check on this, is that q mu j mu equals zero. Well, it's matrix element. Okay. So that all of the, this algebra here, this, this big matrix stuff, all that stuff has to satisfy q dotted into it gives zero. So there's a pretty big constraint on it. Okay. This then implies that the, that matrix element up there has the following form. Okay, uh, u bar of p prime. Well, there can be a, let's pull the minus i e out. It could be a, a gamma mu u of p times some function. Okay. So, if, any, if anything looks like gamma mu, then it satisfies this constraint, just because this one did by itself. So if I take the sum of these, I can call part of it f1. It's only a function of q squared, because that's the only variables left over. Okay. And then the only other piece that satisfies the constraints is the piece that looks like the following, minus i sigma mu nu q nu f2 of q squared, and traditionally you put 1 over 2m there just to make the dimensions right. Um, sigma mu nu is i, gamma, i over 2 gamma mu gamma nu. It's anti-symmetric. That's the main feature. And if this is anti-symmetric, then you can see that if I dot Q into it, you know, if I've already got one Q dotted into it, dot another Q into it, then if that's anti-symmetric, then this thing vanishes automatically. 
Okay. So I'm not going to really say much about this at this stage. I come back to it next class. That's that's where the uh, anomalous magnetic moment lives, but I'm not talking about it now. Okay. What I'm am interested in though is this guy right there. Okay. Because when I do charge renormalization, that's going to play a role. So I'm going to define um, minus I E gamma mu, which is a function of P and P prime, to be minus I E Here's the notation, Z1 minus 1 minus 1, gamma mu plus um, stuff. Okay. And by definition, since this, this other possibility goes like Q, then all I'm left over with is the gamma mu piece. And there's, it's a constant here, so that's, there's no, no Q dependence because I've just defined everything away. So the Q goes to zero limit is this. And I don't know, there's no, there's no real point in making a big calculation of it at this stage. It's, it's there. So the overall then, we get the matrix element of J mu to be U bar minus I E pull out gamma mu plus Z1 minus 1 minus 1, gamma mu plus dot dot plus order Q. U, which is one over Z1. Okay. Okay, so that's what you get for that, okay, just by definition. And the way you, you do it is you just set this P prime equals the P in this thing and calculate away. There's, there's not a, I don't know. And there's, there's maybe it would have been nice to go through that in detail. I don't think we have time in the course to do it. Okay, so let's come back and now do charge renormalization. Okay, I'm going to do on shell, Q goes to zero is defined as on shell renormalization. which basically means that you take a physical scattering process in the physical region and use that to define the charge. Okay, so I'll do electron-proton scattering. So here's the electron-proton scattering. And I do the, the sum of these guys plus the sum of this, just like I drew before. These are all electron-protons. And I'm going to add the vacuum polarization. Okay. Well, what do we get? There's going to be contributions from the ones I just defined, and then there's also going to be charge renormalization, uh, wave function renormalization for the fermions. So let's remind with this before I put it together.
Okay. Okay. So we, if we start off with L0, which is some psi 0 d slash minus m psi 0, we, we, we define this as psi renormalized z i t slash minus m psi renormalized with psi 0 is equal to z 2, and this is actually z 2, to the 1 half psi renormalized. So the, the net effect of that is to, you take an, a z2 to the 1 half for ex, each external state. Okay, so we're going to have to put all these together now. Okay, so there's, there's I think, all our ingredients. So this, this set of vertices, where you do this, this, all those corrections, and that is, well, near Q squared equals to zero, the first term is let's see what's how much should I write out? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so there's a minus I E and we'll put a subscript on it because it's the bare charge squared. So there's at each thing there's a and likewise down here. There's the bare charge squared. We add a wave function renormalization constant for each external state. So there's two electrons, two protons. So Z2 electron, Z2 proton. There's a change in the vertex from summing those diagrams. So when you sum this diagram plus that diagram, you get that this 1 over z1. So you get 1 over z1 electron u bar gamma mu u, 1 over z1 proton u bar gamma mu u. And then there's the vacuum polarization diagram, which modifies the propagator is minus i over q squared, 1 minus pi of q squared. OK, so there's all the pieces. Okay, so if you if you go to q squared goes to zero limit of this. Okay, and there are there are then corrections of order q. Okay, so as q squared goes to zero, you you do take that to be pi of zero with z three is one over one minus pi of zero. And piece all those together, it looks like the following. It looks like minus I E0 squared, oh, let's, let's square that separately, Z2E, Z2P, Z1E, Z1P, Z3. Three from the photon. Okay. 
And so, th and th that is the definition. So we then define E renormalized squared is E zero squared Z two P Z two Z one P Z two E Z one E Z three. Everyone fine with that? Where did the use come from? Oh, where did they go? Um, well, oh, you mean down in the second line here? The, the, this, this, this is then times u bar gamma u times one over q squared u bar gamma mu. Yes, thank you. I just I should have put something to indicate there. Yes, good. Okay, so here this is my basic vertex that leads to my usual scattering diagram. Okay, so in principle we have to calculate all these guys, but here's where the magic occurs: the word identity. is states that z1 equals z2. Okay? It's true for, for, for all particles. Okay, this is I <coughs> okay. It's it's a bit of I say it's magic because it it uh They're very different diagrams. It's it's basically this diagram versus this diagram. One has one propagator, the other has two propagators. There's another different vertices in it. Okay, but nevertheless, it is it's true. Okay, and in fact, your homework, of course, is going to be as you've seen the ones that have the homework there, is to show this in the case of scalar QED. It's actually not not exactly true. It's, it's, there's a modified version of this in QCD, it, so it's not it's not guaranteed. It just it just happens that it works out that way. There's a fancier version in in QCD or things theories like that. Okay, but that that, that then tells us that the renormalized charge is E zero squared Z three. And so it all came from the vacuum polarization. Okay. So this, if you go back, it's e zero squared one minus pi of zero. Okay. So that's the the charge renormalization. Okay. The this this is this is an extremely important because what you, what would have happened if it didn't occur? What if this ratio didn't cancel? Then then the charges for electrons and protons and electrons and muons and muons and protons would all be different. Th this says that that the renormalization Okay. The the these diagrams depend on the external lines. They depend then on the masses of the particles. And if it, the external lines played any role, then the mass of the particles would play a role. And so the electron and a proton, an electron and a muon wouldn't have the same charges. So the, the consequences of that, of course, is if the charges shifted, if not true, 
then the charge on the proton is not equal to the charge on the electron, EE. -E. And atoms would be not neutral. They'd still, they could still be bound. And since the electric field is, electric force is so much stronger than the gravitational force, the Earth would blow apart. Stars repel, etc. So, so this our whole world depends on this this obscure little fact. Okay, questions about that? Okay. If there's no questions, let's let's go on to residual predictions. Actually, let's use this space right here. So clearly, renormalization is not a prediction. It's just a def identifying the right parameters for your theory by saying what is it that you've measured. You have to then go off and make other predictions. In a way, the renormalization is not the interesting part, but it's the part we always spend more time on. So let's do the, the things I'm going to do. I'm going to do first, I'm going to do the running coupling. Everyone has the uh, homework do, do on that, and this gives you a chance to ask about that if you want to see how I do it for QED. I'll do the lamb shift. I want to talk about infrared divergences Photons. I want to talk about G minus two in my prediction. So these these guys are clearly going to be safe for next time. Um, but today I'll do running coupling constant and lamb, lamb shift. Okay, because those those are basically playing with the same things that we've we've done here. Okay. So running coupling. Okay, a running coupling constant sounds like it's an oxymoron because if it's a constant, it doesn't change. But of course, it's, it's just terminology. Okay. So we studied this process. near q squared equals to zero, and we defined e squared over four pi is e zero squared over four pi, one over one minus pi of zero. That's this one over 137. Okay. But what if we had chosen a different renormalization condition? Let's say we had chosen to measure this and q squared is some q zero squared. Mm -hmm. Well, we can get that from our initial thing. We let's call it e squared at q zero squared. Uh, is the bare one over one minus pi of q zero squared. Okay, it was just one minus pi of q squared was what our usual thing. So this is then the value, at least in perturbation theory, this is the value at q squared equals to zero, one minus pi of q squared minus pi of zero. So so we know what we'd get. So that 
that's equally well defined. It's finite. It's calculable. This guy is the one related to 137, and so you could just do that. Okay. And so let's just do that and play with it a little bit. So if q squared is much bigger than m squared, then the number that I had there, pi of q squared minus pi zero was alpha over three pi log of minus q squared over m squared. Okay. Okay, it really should be the sum over all particles um, alpha over 3 pi. The char charge of these particles in units of E <coughs> log down. So that's, that's, I've called that capital Q there in case you can't read it. Q squared over M I squared. And these are all all particles with M squared less than Q squared. Okay. Okay. But I'm not gonna actually bother carrying this along. Let me just carry this and then at some stage later on when I'm when I'm showing you the effect of this, I'll just put the right number in there by summing over all particles. Okay, so if, if you know if you're summing over the up quark, the charge of the up quark is two thirds e, so this becomes two thirds squared. Okay. So, so at this order, um, we get. Well, I guess I. Yeah. So let's just write it out. E squared over 4 pi at, at q0 squared is e squared over 4 pi, which is the 1 over 137, 1 over 1 minus alpha over 3 pi log minus q0 squared over m squared and you can see that you really want to do this. You want to define q0 squared less than 0. Okay, just that's so there's so that, that log is a real number. Okay. So what happens here? This says that this the one over this thing gets gets bigger. As Q zero squared goes up. As Q, Q squared goes up. So the charge gets bigger and bigger as you go up in energy. Okay, so there's basic thing. Now let's go to the renormalization group equation. Okay. So this I, I can explain the terminology a little bit in a minute, but let's just do what uh, the calculation first. So this equation defines how um, e squared of mu squared changes with mu squared. Okay. So if I take the, this definition that we have there and I want to change mu squared or change 
change the scale. So let's take, let's compare Q squared, Q zero squared is mu zero squared and Q one squared is mu one squared. Actually, these, these are minuses just to make the thing real. And so then E squared of mu, mu one squared is E squared over of mu zero squared one minus pi of mu one squared minus pi of mu zero squared which is then e squared of mu of mu zero squared one minus alpha over three pi log mu one squared over mu zero squared okay. which into the order that we're working in perturbation theory is e squared of mu zero squared one minus one plus alpha over three pi log mu mu one squared over mu zero squared. So there's a basic formula. Okay. Now let me just stick four pies in here. You know, put four pies so that I can deal with alphas. Now there's a couple things to point out here. One is that in this alpha here I haven't specified what it is. It's in perturbation theory, so I, I can take this to be alpha of mu zero squared if I want. So in perturbation theory, we take that to be alpha of mu zero squared. The other thing is that, that the mass has dropped out of here. There was a mass when I was comparing Q squared equals to zero, which is smaller than M squared, to Q squared, which is something that's bigger than M squared, there was this log. But now as long as I'm staying bigger than Q squared, it's just um, M squared, then the ratio that appears here, just from this difference, doesn't depend on them anymore. Okay. So we take that and we turn this into, we're going to turn this into a differential equation. This tells you how, at least in perturbation theory, these are related. But now let's turn it into a differential equation by taking the derivative with respect to mu1. Okay. So let's, let's look at mu1 d by d mu1 alpha of mu1. Okay, so here's alpha of mu1 sitting on this side here. And if I go over here, the only place that mu1 sits is right there. So I get, I get a factor taking the mu d by d mu, this, this log disappears, this is constant, I get a factor of two from that. So it's um, alpha times two um, thirds, two over three pi times alpha. Okay. So this is then defined as beta of alpha. This is the beta function. That's 
its name. A beta function for that. And you can see that it's, it's some constant times alpha squared, b0 in this case. At, at this level is this 2 alpha over 3 pi. Okay. Okay, so this now then turns into a differential equation. Mu d by d mu of alpha is beta alpha squared. Okay. Okay. We, we then will solve that. My race is not working today. There it goes. So solving the differential equation, that's an easy one. We just, we're going to turn it into an integral equation. So it's, if I take d alpha over alpha is b0 d mu that's d mu over mu, and that first should have been alpha squared. So this is d alpha divided by alpha squared on this side is d mu divided by mu times b0. Just rearranging that. And then I integrate that. If I integrate it from some mu0 up to mu, I integrate this then from alpha of mu zero up to alpha of mu. <coughs> I'm just doing little math games at this stage. The the one the right side says is b zero log mu over mu zero, and the left side says it's minus 1 over alpha of mu plus 1 over alpha of mu 0. So we've got 1 over alpha of mu is 1 over alpha of mu 0 minus, uh, plus, no minus, minus it is, minus b0 log mu over mu zero. Okay, so alpha minus one is goes linear in log mu. So. Okay, so that's the that's a typical result out of any beta function calculation. So there, now we're going to define, here's an interesting trick. Okay. At the moment, <coughs> these are dimensionless constants. And what I'm about to do is I'll trade this dimensionless constant for a dimension full constant. So we've gone off, we've measured alpha of mu zero at some scale. I'm going to define this measured value is 1 over alpha of mu 0 is going to be defined to be the b0 log lambda over mu 0 for some lambda. Okay? So you take this number, let's, let's pretend it's 1 over 100. This, this, is, this is 1 over 100, so this thing should be a plus a hundred in the numerator. I've got B should carry a subscript B zero. And then I just define lambda such that log lambda over mu zero is a hundred when multiplied by, by zero. Okay? So one of the things you see here is that <coughs> for if, if alpha is bigger than if alpha is a positive number, which it's 
it needs to be the charge squared. Lambda has to be much bigger than mu zero. At least has to be bigger than mu zero, anyhow. Okay, so that this is positive. Okay. Okay, so if you take that that definition now, I've changed the number that you measure, the dimensionless number, into something that's that's a dimensionful number. But nothing stops me from doing that. I get one over alpha of mu is B0 log lambda over mu0 minus B0 log mu over mu0 is then the mu0 now disappear. There is no mu0 left anymore. B0 log lambda over mu. Okay. So then alpha of mu and this is the, the final result that I'm after is 1 over B0 log lambda over mu. Okay. No more mu zeros around. No more alphas of mu zeros. That's all been traded into this constant lambda. Okay. So if you think about what this means here, this so it's a really beautiful result in its way. You've traded off all this stuff in terms of this one parameter. But this tells you that as mu gets bigger, remember lambda is bigger than mu, so as mu gets bigger, um, this number becomes smaller. Right? When mu is small, this is a big number. When mu gets big, this becomes a smaller number. log of the smaller number is smaller, so alpha becomes bigger. So we see that alpha versus mu runs up as, as mu gets bigger, alpha gets bigger. That's the nature of the <coughs> running coupling constant. Okay. And when done ca carefully, one thing to remember is that <coughs> alpha at the scale of the z, the z boson, is 1 over 128, not 1 over 137, which is, of course, a bigger number than 1 over 137. So it has, it's going up. Okay. Good. So there's the other, the other funny thing about this that you see is if I take mu bigger and bigger, eventually it hits lambda, and so there's in this, there's what's called the Landau pole. Alpha looks like it goes to infinity as mu goes to lambda. Okay. So that it actually not only gets bigger, it seems to blow up. Okay, this is a bit of a, uh, it could be misleading. This is true in perturbation theory. Okay, but, but perturbation theory breaks down. as alpha gets much bigger than 1. 
And so you actually don't know what the behavior is really. Okay? So you don't really know. Okay? The other thing to point out about this is where does the Landau pole live? Okay, so remember, well, actually, at this stage, I have to give you what B0 really is. B0 is, turns into 10 over 3 pi with, with all the standard model particles. Okay, I gave, we gave you the form as 2 over 3 pi for the electron, there's the mu and the tau, and then there's all the fractionally charged particles, the 2 thirds and 1 third. Okay. So that's, this is, this is the, the real answer. It's useful. And we, I just told you that alpha of mz is 1 over b0 log lambda over mz is 1 over 126, was it? 128. Zero. Okay. Thank you. So then, then I can solve for lambda. Lambda is mz e to the uh, three pi over ten one over alpha at mz is mz e to the 116. Okay, so 3 pi over 10 is is a number that's just a little smaller than 1. So it changes 128 to 116, which is then 2 times 10 to the 52 GeV, which is, you know, the proton mass Which is which is way up there. Okay, it's way beyond anything we can do. It's way beyond the Planck scale, etc. Okay. Okay. So anyone want to ask questions about this running coupling constant? No. We will never find out whether, whether there's a pole or not because we can't get there. Okay. Given the time left, uh, let me see if I can do the, the lamb shift for us. Okay. The lamb shift is, is uh, historically the first prediction for, for quantum field theory. So that's it's important for that reason. The context is the following: is that in the hydrogen atom, the f a half states and the p a half states are degenerate. Okay, so if you do the non-relativistic hydrogen atom, that's, that's well known. It's also true even in the Dirac treatment. So originally, people thought maybe it would be something about the Dirac treatment that would, would change this, but it doesn't. But Lamb, Mr. Willis Lamb, measured a splitting. A small splitting between those two, and that ended up being resolved by beta. Which is was a profound realization that it was actually loops in quantum field theory that that made up the difference. 
Okay, and we, we've seen it. We actually can see, it's actually easy to see the basic idea, and then we'll talk about the details a bit more. <coughs> the basic idea is when we do what we just did there, we do this plus this plus this plus this. This turns into, well, there's u bar gamma mu u on one side, u bar gamma mu u on the other side. There's minus i e squared. Um, if I choose this to be the renormalized e, then this starts like 1 over q squared. But then there's some residual stuff, f of q squared, um, left over. Okay, so let's just, just do it like that. Okay, so you know, there's some, some shift, some change in that. And if, if this f goes, this starts off as q squared, then this term goes like 1 over q squared plus a constant plus then order q squared. Okay, so that the, the constant piece is there. And then the, the way you get the potentials is, you know, then in coordinate space, v of r is anterior d3 q over 2 pi cubed. If I take e to the i q dot r and I take the Fourier transform of 1 over q squared, that goes into the usual 1 over r potential. If I take the integral d3 q over 2 pi cubed e to the i q dot r of the constant piece, that goes into a delta function. constant times a delta function. And then the logic goes that the S waves get shifted because their, their wave function at the origin is not equal to zero. So the, the delta function potential then shifts it. whereas the P waves don't. P wave, the wave function of the origin is zero, implied no, no change in energy. And then this piece then gives the, it's the 2s a half minus 2p a half is, is the actual lamp shift, okay? So the basic idea is that, you know, in what we've calculated, we, we take the next term. So we, we've refocused on this guy. We then take the next term, which is a Taylor extent of, of a constant. You get uh, this contribution. Okay. So there's two places you have to do it. You have to do it here. and here. And those two both have it. Okay, so the um, first, let's, uh, let's, we have to do this quickly. The vertex 
Um, remember, we saw that the the current had the form u bar gamma mu f1 of q squared plus or minus i sigma mu nu q nu f2 over 2m. Okay, this this guy doesn't contribute. We'll return to that again. That's next class. But F1, if I just expand F1 as 1 plus A of Q squared, so Q squared over M squared, dimensionally plus dot dot dot, then this A goes into the lamp shift. So there's basically, or you, you calculate that diagram, you, you find this F1, you expand it, that part goes to lamp shift. I'm actually hiding something here. Which I'll come back to next time. There's, but, but basically that's the right answer. Okay. And then the, the other piece that one gets is the vacuum polarization. Here I won't have to hide anything. Um, the, the vacuum polarization ends up looking like 1 minus pi of q squared, which we wrote as I'll just subtract off the pi of zero already there. This ends up being one plus um, alpha over 15 pi q squared over m squared. And so this is the constant and this alpha over 15 pi one over m squared is the piece that works. And the other the thing that you can see out of this is that you only need the electron side because 1 over m e squared is much, much bigger than 1 over m p squared. Okay, so you don't really need to do the proton side. Actually, that's true. Up, that's you just that's true everywhere. Actually, I should have set it up there. Okay, the relative amounts Okay, the experimental number is it's expressed as an N, as a frequency shift just. N dividing out the factor of H is 1057.873 plus or minus 0 0.020 megahertz. Okay. The vertex correction Okay, is 1085 megahertz. The vacuum polarization is minus 27 So both are needed. Though it's true that the in what we did previously is the vacuum polarization was the major player. Here the vacuum polarization is the minor player and the, but the, and the major one is the vertex direction. But 
they, you, you can't get around it. It's, they're both needed. And it, I know it doesn't add up, and there's some some small correction that that I don't have um, in those. This, this must be the lowest order numbers that I'm quoting, and then the higher order numbers come from higher orders in perturbation theory, okay, because, I, because those don't quite add up. Okay, but this was the, the first big success of quantum field theory was getting that number. Okay. So let me stop there for today. I come back, I'll do some things about soft radiation. I'll do G minus two stuff. I'm going to do a little bit of Yang Mills theory. So QCD generalizes other theories. And then we'll I'll finish up the QED section. Okay, good. So see, I'll see you next time. Very good. Yes.